Hungarian folk tales. The poor man and his fiddle. Far, far away, beyond the high mountain and across the vast ocean, there lived a king who had three beautiful daughters. One day the queen said to the three daughters, Off you go, girls, to the forest to pick wild berries, and whoever picks the most will have my red skirt. So off they went, and they picked and picked berries as fast as they could. When noon was near and the sun high, they settled down in the shade of a tree and looked to see which of them had gathered the most. Now the youngest had picked more than her two sisters, together. The two turned green with envy. The youngest sister would have the red skirt. So the eldest of the three had this to say. Girls, girls, come and pick some more for we cannot go home with so few berries. The youngest argued and argued for if they went on picking and picking they would never be home before evening. But her two elder sisters insisted that they stay in the forest. And so it passed. Off went the two into one part of the forest, the youngest to another. But not to pick berries, for they agreed to kill their younger sister. If they could not have the red skirt, then their sister should not have it either. So they set off after her and took hold of her. She begged and pleaded in vain and offered them all the berries she had, but they killed her. Just when they had taken her life, a blind beggar arrived with his fiddle and bow. The sisters took the fiddle off the old beggar, placed their dead sister inside it, and hid the fiddle in a hole in a tree. Home went the girls and were asked where their sister was. Of course, they didn't know. They warned her again and again not to stray into the forest, but she didn't heed them. Who knew? She may have lost her way or even been killed by robbers who live in the forest. In the meantime, a poor man went off to the forest to cut himself some timber. He chopped down the very tree in which the body of the little princess had been placed. The poor man was astonished to see a fiddle spring out of the tree. He took the fiddle into his hands and started to draw the bow on the fiddle, across and up, just like the gypsies did. Now this fiddle was a fiddle that did not just make music, it sang as well. Draw the bow, good and slow, my good fellow, my good fellow. Harm it not, for the fiddle is me. The fiddle you play is Princess Betty. Goodness me, thought the poor man, this fiddle must have a spell on it. Now's my chance to seek my fortune, for a fortune it will be if someone pays to hear this wonderful song. Off set the poor man to wander the whole wide world and earn so much money that an entire cart could hardly suffice to carry it after him. On his travels he came to the town of the king, whose youngest daughter met a death so cruel. He stopped outside the king's palace and began to play his fiddle. The king heard the wonderful melody and asked a servant to order the fiddler into his palace. The servant ran out and delivered the message, but the musician replied that not one step would he take, for he had more money than the king himself. Back ran the servant to report what the musician had said. There was nothing for it. The king himself stepped out and invited the musician into his palace to play for him. So often did he ask that the musician went in, tapped on the fiddle twice and started to draw the bow. Draw the bow, good and slow, my good fellow, my good fellow. Harm it not, for the fiddle is me, the fiddle you play is Princess Betty. The king had this to say. A wonder of a song, a wonder. 
the two princesses were standing by and gaping at the song. One of them took the fiddle and started to play it to see what it would sing for her. Draw the bow, good and slow. You killed me, but no one knows. The other princess took up the fiddle and it sang the very same for her. Then the king took up the fiddle and the fiddle had this to sing for him. Draw your bow, good and slow. Princess Betty loves you so. This is witchcraft for sure. Let me try the fiddle too, said the queen. So she took up the fiddle and started to play, and the fiddle had this to sing for her. Draw the bow, good and slow, mother dear, mother dear. Harm it not, for the fiddle is me, Princess Betty is here, you see. And at that very moment, the fiddle opened up and out jumped the little princess, as alive and as beautiful as a spring flower. The two elder sisters fainted away in fear. The king and queen wept tears of joy for the daughter they had lost and mourned, but had now returned in such a miraculous way. Now that the cruelty of the two elder sisters had come to light, the king locked them up in a tower, there to stay until death took them away. But the little princess begged and pleaded her father until the king relented and had mercy on the two. And from then on, they all lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Dyer's Apprentice Once upon a time, there lived a woodcutter with his wife. On a fine spring morning, the woman gave birth to a baby boy. By the time the lad turned 13 years of age, the woodcutter died. The boy and his mother were very poor. Finally, the young boy walked into the village looking for a job. There he came upon a dyer who hired him as an apprentice. He earned only very little as an apprentice, but he always gave every penny to his mother. Suddenly, one morning, he turned to his mother. Mother, I had a dream last night. Tell me all about it, my son. I cannot talk about my dream before it is time, even if my life depends on it, he said. Well, all right. In the morning, the boy went to see his master, told him that he had had a dream, but he never revealed what his dream was about. The master got angry and started beating his apprentice. The boy ran out to the street, but the master rushed after him with a whip in his hand. At that very moment in time, the king was passing by in his gilded carriage, and he called to the master. Hey you, why are you beating that young man? The master told the king everything, one by one. Finally, the king ordered him to hand over the boy to him, and he would find out what the dream was all about. Once they got to the king's court, the young lad was literally bathed in milk and honey. Three weeks later, the king summoned the boy and asked him how he liked being in the palace. I quite like it here, replied the boy. Well, you see, son, I am trying my best to please you, said the king. What about pleasing me a little? Oh, your majesty, I will do whatever I can to please you, but what can I do if it isn't possible? All right then, all you should do is tell me what you dreamt the other night. 
Oh, your majesty, that is an impossible task because even if you take my life, I cannot reveal my dream to you before it comes true. And so it went on and on for seven years, but all was in vain. Finally, the king lost all hope and patience and had the boy walled in. In the meantime, the king's daughter also grew up to be a beautiful girl and she fell in love with the boy. She stole a purse filled with gold coins from her father and gave it to the bricklayer. She instructed the man to leave a small opening in the wall. Through that small opening, she gave food to the young boy three times a day. She kept feeding him every day for another seven years. In the meantime, the Turkish Sultan announced he wished to marry the princess, but the old king did not want to hear about it. The Sultan sent three identical donkeys to the king, asking him to identify the exact age of each animal. Otherwise, he would attack and destroy the king's country. The king was frightened and he ran around asking everybody for a solution, but nobody was able to tell the exact age of the donkeys. As the daughter was carrying lunch to the boy behind the wall one day, she told him what had happened. In the end, the boy told her not to worry. He told her to go home and sleep through the night. And when she awoke the next morning, she should tell her father the following. Give the donkeys oats that are one, two and three years old. The animals will eat the oats that correspond with their own age. And so it happened. The king was happy that he finally managed to save his country. But the Turk just couldn't rest. He wrote another letter to the king with the following message. This time I am sending you a stick with bludgeons on both ends. He wrote. If you cannot tell which is the upper and which is the lower end of the stick, I am going to have you decapitated. The king's joy suddenly turned to sorrow. In the meantime, the princess dreamt that if they tied a single hair around the middle of the stick and lifted it, the lower end, which was thicker, would bend towards the ground. They immediately sent a letter with the answer to the Sultan. The Sultan was so angry, he nearly had a fit, but he could still not rest. He sent another letter plus three pen knives, asking the king to identify which of the knives belonged to a gentleman, a soldier, and to a peasant. Once again, the princess dreamed up the solution. She said that the knife should be stuck into the ground next to a burning fire. The one that smells like garlic belongs to a peasant. The one that smells of scent belongs to a gentleman. And finally, the one that oozes blood must belong to the soldier. The king was overjoyed and sent a letter to the Turkish Sultan. The Sultan never sent another letter. The king was curious to find out how his daughter always knew the right answers. Finally, his daughter confessed everything and the king ordered his men to tear down the wall. Everyone was happy and they held a magnificent wedding in the palace. As they were eating, the king once again asked the apprentice to tell him what his dream was all about. This was my dream, your majesty, he said, pointing to his bride and the wedding ring. And they all lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales Seven at One Blow Once 
Once upon a time, long, long ago, there lived a tanner. Now this tanner had as many children as a sieve has holes, and even more. One day he was cooking porridge for his children. There was just enough for each to have a drop. It was hot. It was summertime, and a swarm of flies flew in through the window. And this sent the tanner into such a rage that he lifted his hand and brought it down hard on the table. He managed to get seven of the flies at one and the same time. So he thought to himself, "Am I not a true and gallant knight to hit seven at one blow?" He made for himself a sign, and on it he wrote, "Seven at one blow," and this he wore around his neck. Off he went to seek his way in the world, and eventually he came upon a well deep in the forest. So he lay himself down and slept. Just then came devils to sup from the water. One of these devils saw him and said, "Now this is a true and gallant knight. He's not a man to battle with." No sooner had he said this than the tanner woke up, and then the devil said, "Will you not come and serve us, true?" Your job will be to carry water in this bison skin. With that, they went off to where the devils lived, in the infernal fire, or somewhere deep in hell. And the devils drank the water up in a flash. So then, the king of the devils said, "What wages do you require? A load of gold carried home, and I will ride on top of it." And so the bargain was struck. They passed the man the bison skin. The poor man almost collapsed under the weight of it. He set out for the well. He wondered how he was going to be able to carry it back full when he could hardly manage to carry it when it was empty. So he got hold of a spade, and when he arrived, he started to dig around the well. Now the devils got fed up of waiting for him to come back with the water, so one of them upped and went off after him. Said the devil, "What are you doing, Tanner? I'm not going to come here back and forth and fetch water for you all the time. I'm going to bring the whole well in one go." No, don't do that. You see, my mother is blind, and she's going to fall into the hole. I'll fetch the water for you. You fetch wood from the forest instead. And with this, they started off back. Then the devil led him to the forest to show him how much wood he had to gather up and bring back. The devil took the top of a tree and bent it down, and the tanner held on to it. Then the branch came loose from the devil's hand, and as the tree sprang back, it threw the tanner up and over the forest. Out sprang a rabbit from under the bush, and the tanner chased it. Asked the devil, "Now where are you running? After this rabbit, don't you see? I jumped across the forest for it, and I still couldn't catch it." Then the devil ran home and told the others, "Get rid of this tanner, because he's a bigger devil than any of us." The tanner said he wouldn't go away because there was a devil here stronger than him, and he pointed at one of the devils, saying he was the stronger one. And the devil said, "I'm stronger than you. Come with me to the top of the hill. We'll take a whip with us and make it crack. <laughs> Whoever makes the whip crack louder is surely the stronger of us too." The tanner said, "I don't mind, but give me a club as well." When they got there, the devil said, "You go first at cracking the whip." And no," said the tanner. "You go first." The devil took the whip and cracked it so hard that the tanner went and fell over. I wanted to hold the end of the whip, but you were too fast for me. Now then," said the devil, "it's really your go. Well, if it's my go, close your eyes because when I do it, you'll go blind." The devil closed his eyes, and the tanner smacked him right on the head with a club. Then he asked, 
Now who can crack the whip harder? And the devil said, You can crack it harder. You're a bigger devil than all of us. So they went back and the devil said to the rest of them, Take this tanner home right away. So they put the money into a big tub and he sat on top of it. When he got home, his children came out and said, Father, Father, how long is it since we last had the meat of a devil? The devil emptied the tub, money, tanner and all, and ran off back to hell. It's a good thing that we got rid of him, he told the other devils. Even his children want to eat the meat of a devil. And that was the full of the story, from its head all the way to its tail. Hungarian Folk Tales The Round Stone Once upon a time there lived a poor man. He had many, many children. Off he would go to catch a fish for the table, for they were very poor and had to eat. His wife would cook these fish for all the children. That's what they had to live on. Now not far away from there lived his brother and his family. And very rich he was too. But he never helped his brother out. When there wasn't a bite to eat in the poor man's house, he would send to his brother in the name of God to let him have enough flour to make supper for the children. But he never got any. Once, when there was hardly a scrap to eat for a whole week, the poor fisherman said to his wife he was off to fish and he wouldn't come back until his satchel was full. He sat down on the bank early in the morning. No matter where he cast his net, there was nothing in it when he drew it in, not even a fish as big as my little finger. Now dusk was on him and still no fish. The poor man grew very angry. Well then, he thought, that's it. I'll cast the net one more time, and no matter what, I'll go home. When he pulled it out, well, it was as heavy as could be. Now then, said he to himself, there must be a huge fish in it. Indeed, he could hardly pull the net out of the water. Out it came, and what was in it but a great, big, round stone. Ah, well, said he, I'll take it home anyway. At least the children at home will be able to play with it. And home he took it. His children were still awake. They looked at the great big round stone and started to play with it. They couldn't go to bed. They were having such fun with the game. They rolled it up and rolled it down the room and screamed with delight because the stone was getting brighter and brighter. Look, wife dear, this is some kind of wonder of a stone. It's shining like a diamond. Dear heart, said she, it's a diamond for sure. So they quickly decided that she should go next day to show the stone to the king himself, to see if he wanted to buy it for a lot of money. Up she rose at the dawning of day, wrapped the stone in a kerchief and set off to see the king. First she saluted the king in the proper way. She took out the stone and showed it to him. Now where did you find that, my poor good woman, said the king, and was astonished. She told him that her husband had found it in the water. Then, my poor good woman, let me have it and I'll give you a thousand florins for it. Because he knew that it was a real diamond. The poor woman did not say a word. She just gave a little cough. Well, if a thousand isn't enough, I'll give you two thousand. 
and the poor woman coughed again and was so confused that not a word could she speak. But the king thought she wanted more. Listen then, my poor good woman. Would you think three sacks of gold would be enough for the stone? This time she didn't cough. She just nodded her head. Straight away the king filled three sacks with gold and even gave her a cart and a horse so that she could go home. Well, didn't she go home in great happiness? Or wasn't there great happiness at home too? Never again would they go hungry. Well then, dear wife, said the poor fisherman, we should weigh the gold to see how much we have. Right you are, said she. Now there wasn't a weight in the house. One of the boys went to see the rich uncle. What would you be wanting a weight for? asked the rich relation mockingly. My father wants to waste some money, said the boy. Well, the rich relative had a great laugh at this. Here you are, son. Here's the weight. And I'll come too, for this is something I have to see. Your father weighing money. So the rich relation stood, and all he could do was open his mouth and his eyes wide in amazement. Not even he had ever seen as much money all at once. Where did you get all that gold from? Hmm, the fisherman thought to himself. I'll have a little joke here. The king gave it to me in return for three cats. How could that be? asked the rich relation. Well, the fact is, brother, the king's palace is knee-deep in mice. So many that the king and the royal family cannot even eat their lunch or their supper. I heard of this, and while I was coming and going, I got three cats and brought them with me as a present for the king. It was as if I'd been given a reprieve. So delighted was the king, and he straight away gave me three sacks of gold for the three cats. The rich relation heard this and couldn't wait to get started. Well, up he went and called everywhere in the village, everywhere in the villages around them, and he bought every cat there was for a right handful of money. He packed them all into his cart and off he went to the king. What have you come here for? asked the king. Your majesty, I heard that you were in great need of cats, so that's what I've brought you. You mean in that sack there's nothing but cats? Let me see. The rich relation opened the sack. There were cats jumping all over the place. Cats to the right, cats to the left, cats everywhere. And you know what cats are like? They ripped and tore at everything. Dear heavens, what is going on here? Many cats, that's what. The king had him seized for playing such a trick on him. He threw him into prison, and for all I know, he's still in there, if he hasn't been set free for catting the king. Once upon a time, there lived an old king who had two fine sons. One day they stood before their father and they said it was time for them to go and see the world and the seven seas. The old king was sad, but as there was nothing he could do, he filled their pockets with gold and bade them farewell. The boys said goodbye and off they went. They kept walking for a long time until they finally reached a strange new town. When they arrived, the people of the town were having a fair. They were selling beautiful bouquets of flowers and each prince bought one for himself. They tied a red ribbon around one and a green around the other 
and they went on their way. Suddenly they came upon a man with a huge beard. Which way are you going, old man? I would like to sell these animals here, he said, if only there was someone to buy them. The two princes felt very sorry for the old man, and since they liked the animals anyway, they finally bought them. And so they kept marching forward until they came to a fork in the road. Finally, the younger one said, It's your turn to choose, brother. I will take the black road. All right, but let me tell you what. See this walnut tree by the roadside? Let's both tie our bouquets on a branch. When one of us gets back here and sees that the flowers of the other one have wilted and withered, he should know that his brother is dead. They did so and went their separate ways. The older brother kept going until he arrived in a town. The place was all covered in black drapes. The prince went into an inn and asked the innkeeper why they were in mourning. The innkeeper explained that there was a foreign knight who said that the king should give him the country and his daughter unless he was defeated by one of the king's men. Many young warriors responded to the challenge, but they were all slain, including the two sons of the king. Our prince challenged the foreign knight the next morning, and he was so quick and clever with a sword that the foreign knight was killed in an instant. <laughs> there was celebration and joy in the town. The king took the prince to his palace and promised him the hand of his daughter, plus the country, once he died. And they lived happily without a care in the world. One day the king said, I would love to eat some wild boar. I'll be happy to get you some if that's what you want. The prince mounted his horse and rode out to the forest, taking the animals with him. He was busy trying to find a wild boar, but finally, night fell. He settled down and made a fire to keep himself warm. Suddenly, he heard a voice calling from the tree above. I'm cold. I'm freezing. If you're so cold, why don't you come down? I have a fire burning down here. This should warm you up. As he looked up, he spotted an incredibly old woman among the branches. I would never dare to descend. I'm frightened of the beast, she croaked. I will throw down a twig, hit all of them with it, then I know they won't hurt me anymore. The prince did as he was told, and all of a sudden, all three animals turned into stone. The old hag jumped down from the tree, seized the twig from the young man, and hit him too. The prince immediately turned to stone himself. They were all waiting for the prince to return home, but it was in vain. One month went by, and during that time, the younger prince visited the town of Joy and returned to the large walnut tree. He saw that his brother's bouquet was wilted and dry. He walked down the road until he got to the town. He found the same inn that his brother visited before him. The innkeeper was very happy to see him. Thank heavens, the prince is back. Hey, good man. I'm not the one I seem to be, said the younger prince. The man before me was probably my brother. I am trying to find him myself. When he spoke to the old king, he told him that his beloved son-in-law went to the forest and no one had seen him since. I shall not rest until I find him, said the younger prince. Finally, he himself was lost just like his brother. When darkness fell, he lit a fire to keep himself warm and his animals also stretched out for a rest. Suddenly, he heard a wailing from above his head. I am cold. I am freezing. If you're so cold, why don't you come down, he said. I have a fire burning down here. This should warm you up. But I'm afraid of the beasts. I will throw down a twig, hit all three of them with it, and then I'll know they won't hurt me anymore. Maybe this old witch killed his brother. Instead of touching the animals, he only stroked the dirt with a twig. And when the old hag jumped down from the tree, she was attacked by the wild beasts. What have you done with my brother? Where is he? The large stone behind you is your brother, and the three flat ones are the animals. Swish them with the twig, your touch will revive them. The prince did as he was told. His brother told him everything. Finally, he returned to the witch. 
Good deeds are rewarded by good in return, but evil deeds shall be punished. Now it is your turn to turn to stone, lest you should harm another soul. The old witch turned into stone and never left the forest again. She is still there to this very day. Where? Somewhere on this side of here and the far side of there, where a little pig snorts the air. Hungarian Folk Tales The Poor Man and His Horse Once upon a time, long ago and far away, there lived a poor man. Now he had two sons and he had a grey horse. He was very poor and had to earn his bread by carting. Here and there he trudged with that grey horse of his, for that was the only way he could put food on the table. But the roads were so bad and very muddy. Now that grey horse had had enough of pulling the cart all by himself. Back he looked and said, You're a good and kind owner, so will you buy a partner for me? You can speak? Of course I can, after all these years of learning how from you. So will you buy a partner for me? I would indeed, if only I had the money. Do you know what? Let me loose and I'll get what we need. How can I let you loose? If I do that, you'll never come back and you'll leave me here. Die I won't for sure, you're my owner. So the man led him out of the stable, took the halter off him and let him go. The grey horse was very happy. Up went his tail, he whizzed around the yard once or twice and off he went. The man was very worried. That's a horse I'll never see back here again, he thought. Well. The grey horse headed off out of the village. Off he went up to the forest and there he ate well from the greenest grass and came upon the sweet water of a bubbling spring. Then off he went to look around the forest. There he found the entrance to a fox's den. It looked good, so he snuggled himself into it and there he fell asleep. Just then the vixen and her cubs woke up. It was coming time to go and find something to eat. So the vixen turned to her eldest cub and said, Now, son, just go out and see what the weather's like outside. Off went the little fox, who got as far as the entrance to the den. He could see that everything had gone all white, so he quickly rushed back to tell the others. Mother, we can't go out at all. There's been a big fall of snow and it's blocked the way. That got him a slap on the ear from his mother. How can you say there's snow when we're right in the middle of summer? Out you go, she said to another of her cubs, and see what the weather's like outside. The second cub turned back and said to his mother, Mother, we can't go out at all. There's such a lot of snow. Thump, and he got one across his ear as well. The vixen sighed and she went up. She looked and right enough, everything had gone all white. She sniffed the air, but it wasn't cold. She thought about it and dug out another entrance to the den. When she went out, what did she see, believe it or not, but a great big grey horse that had died and was lying at the entrance to the den. It couldn't have come to a better place to die. We'll pull it in somehow and that will see us through the long days of winter. Now it was all very well for her to plan, but she couldn't even move the horse. Oh dear, what was there to do? She thought about it and off she went to see the wolf. Who's there? It's me, Brother Wolf. What can I do for your sister fox? 
I bring you good news, brother. Just let me in. And the wolf let her in. Right. There's a big grey horse that has come and died at my front door and I can't drag him away. So I thought that you're a big and strong creature and the two of us can surely drag him off somewhere and have his meat for the winter. The wolf licked his lips and off he went with the vixen. Once they got there, around, around they sniffed. They pushed and they pulled, but it didn't work. Sister Fox, you haven't got a good hold of it. Try to push. They tried and tried, but they couldn't manage. Then she spoke up. Do you know what we can do? We can tie your tail to the horse's tail. You pull away and I'll push. That's the only way we'll manage it. Fine, Sister Fox, said the wolf. So the wolf went around to the horse's tail and the fox made a fine tight knot out of their two tails. Well, the wolf started pulling and pulled and pulled until it was out of breath. Push now, sister, push. I'll pull and you can push. Now the horse felt the wolf pulling hard on his tail. He woke up and jumped to his feet. He shook himself, started to race off, and there was the wolf still tied to his tail and swinging from left to right as they went. And when the horse was sure the wolf was well and truly dizzy, off he galloped towards the village. Once he arrived home, he let out a loud neigh. Out rushed his owner. He's home, he's home, thank heavens, my fine grey horse. He quickly opened the gate to the yard. Here you are, good master, said the horse. I've brought you this wolf so you can have his fine fur and sell it. And with that, you can buy another horse. And that's what happened. They took the wolf skin to the market and with the price, they bought another horse and went their way with two horses, just like any other men. And they all lived happily ever after. And that's the end of my tale of a poor man and of the tale of his faithful horse. Hungarian Folk Tales The Little Cockerel and the Hedge Once upon a time, a little cockerel went out under the hedge to scratch around. He scratched and scratched around until the hedge was uprooted. Along came a magpie and asked the uprooted hedge, Now what's the matter with you, hedge? Only yesterday you were standing here all healthy and strong. Dear me, brother magpie, replied the hedge. The little cockerel came out to scratch around under me and now I'm uprooted. Well then, I'll pull out my fine tail, said the magpie, and he pulled out his own tail feathers just like that. Off he flew to a walnut tree. The walnut tree was astonished at how scruffy the magpie looked. So the walnut tree asked, What's happened to you, brother magpie? Only yesterday you had a fine tail, and now you are all scruffy. Dear me, brother tree, answered the magpie. The little cockerel went out to scratch around under the hedge. The hedge was uprooted and I pulled out my fine tail. Well then, I'll clip off my fine twigs, said the walnut tree. And he clipped off his twigs just like that. Around noon came a deer to rest under the walnut tree out of the great heat. She could see that the walnut tree was now completely bald. What happened to you, walnut tree? 
Only yesterday you were green and flourishing. Now today you're all bald. Dear me, sister dear, answered the walnut tree. The little cockerel went out this morning to scratch around under the hedge. The hedge was uprooted. The magpie pulled out its fine tail feather and I clipped off all my twigs. Well then, I'll chase away my two fine sons, said the deer, and she sent them both away just like that, for which she grieved and grieved. When she felt thirsty, she went to the well for a drink. Now the well was astonished to see the deer appear alone, because she always brought her two fine sons with her. So the well asked, How is it you are on your own today, sister dear? Where have you left your two fine sons? Dear me, brother well, said the deer. The little cockerel went out this morning to stretch around under the hedge. The hedge was uprooted. The magpie pulled out its fine tail. The walnut tree clipped off all his twigs. And I sent my two fine sons away. Well then, I'll turn my fine wine into blood, said the well. And so he did. Now when Sarah, the serving girl, went to the well with her pail, she asked the well, What's this well? How is it today that you're full of blood instead of your sweet water? Dear me, Sarah, said the well. The little cockerel went out this morning to scratch around under the hedge. The hedge was uprooted. The magpie pulled out his fine tail. The walnut tree clipped off all his twigs. The deer sent her two fine sons away. And the water in me has turned to blood. Well, then I'll beat my own head with this pail. And so she did. And off she went with a swollen, battered head back to her mistress. Her mistress asked, What happened to you, Sarah? Dear me, mistress, said Sarah. The little cockerel went out this morning to scratch around under the hedge. The hedge was uprooted. The magpie pulled out his fine tail. The walnut tree clipped off all his twigs. The deer sent her two fine sons away. The water in the well turned to blood. And I beat my own head with the pail. Well then, I'll spread my dough all over the wall. It was just ready for kneading, but she went ahead and spread it all over the wall. Now when the master of the house came home that evening, he saw that the dough was spread all over the wall. Have you gone mad or what, dear wife? That you spread the dough all over the wall? Dear me, husband. The little cockerel went out this morning to scratch around under the hedge. The hedge was uprooted. The magpie pulled out his fine tail. The walnut tree clipped off all his twigs. The deer sent her two fine sons away. The water in the well turned to blood. Sarah beat her own head with a pail. And I spread the dough all over the wall. Well then, I'll shave off my fine beard. And he shaved it off just like that. Not long later, the son of the house came home and saw his father with a face like a plucked chicken. He asked, What happened to you, father dear? Son, there's been nothing but trouble here all day. The little cockerel went out this morning to scratch around under the hedge. The hedge was uprooted. The magpie pulled out his fine tail. The walnut tree clipped off all his twigs. The deer sent her two fine sons away. The water in the well turned to blood. Sarah beat her own head with a pail. Your mother spread the dough all over the wall. And I went and shaved off my fine beard. Fair enough, said the lad. I'll go out and cut off the legs of our four oxen. With that, he picked up his axe, went to the buyer, and straight away cut off a foreleg of one of the oxen. He was just about to take the axe to another when a soldier just happened to arrive and cried to him, Have you lost your mind, my lad? What are you doing to that ox? Dear me, soldier, sir. The little cockerel went out this morning to scratch around under the hedge. The hedge was uprooted. The magpie pulled out his fine tail. The walnut tree clipped off all his twigs. The deer sent her two fine sons away. The water in the well turned to blood. Sarah beat her own head with a pail. My mother spread the dough all over the wall. My father shaved off his fine beard completely. And now I'm cutting off the legs of our four oxen. Only when the moon turns green, shouted the soldier, and gave the lad such a beating with the flat of his sword that it was all he could do to stagger back into the house. The soldier drove the oxen off to the fair and sold them. With his time served as a soldier, he was free to marry. And from the oxen prize, he threw a great feast of a wedding. And they all lived happily ever after.
Hungarian folk tales. The slipper tearing princesses. Once upon a time, there lived a king who had three daughters. Each of them wore and tore 12 pairs of slippers every single night. Finally, the king could not supply them any longer with footwear so he issued a declaration across the land. He declared that anyone who could tell him where his daughters wore out their slippers every night would receive a very attractive payment as reward. The king had a young lad who worked as a shepherd. As he was grazing his flock of sheep one day, he suddenly decided to visit the royal palace. When he arrived, he told the king his reasons for coming. Your Majesty, I shall find out where your daughters go every night. All right, go ahead, and if you are successful, you'll get a rich reward. The king sent the shepherd boy to sleep in the same room where his daughters slept. The lad lay down on the floor with his bag and stick and pretended to be asleep. It was around midnight when he saw an old witch fly in through the window. She produced some kind of cream or ointment which the princesses rubbed on their knees and arms. As soon as they were done, they all hopped on a broom, took all their slippers and flew out of the window. The shepherd boy watched carefully and finally he rubbed the ointment on himself and his stick. As soon as he was done, he whooshed right after the princesses, never letting them out of his sight. It wasn't long before the girls reached a silver forest, where they all settled down to rest. In the middle of the forest there was a silver well, with three silver goblets standing right next to it. The three princesses each had a sip of water. When they were finished, the shepherd boy collected their silver goblets and put them in his bag. He even broke off a silver twig from one of the trees. The twig rang out loud when he snapped it from the branch. The small princess was very frightened. Why are you so scared, silly? Nobody can follow us here. So after a while, they all got on their broomsticks and flew off. They finally reached the middle of the golden forest. There was a well made of gold with three golden goblets standing right next to it. Each girl took a sip of water. The lad even broke a golden twig from one of the trees. The twig rang out loud when it snapped from the branch. The smallest prince was very frightened. Don't be such a coward, there's nobody here. Who could it be anyway? They flew off, but the shepherd was still following them. They soon arrived at the diamond forest where there was a well made of diamonds with diamond goblets on the side. When the princesses all had their fill, the shepherd collected the goblets, broke a diamond twig, the twig rang out loud, and the smallest princess was very frightened. Stop being scared all the time, there's nobody following us. They got on their brooms and continued their flight. Suddenly a huge gate opened up before them from somewhere below the ground. Inside there were 12 young he-devils waiting for them, and there was music playing from the attic. The shepherd boy quickly hid beneath the table and he kept a close watch on everything. The he-devils and the girls started to dance. As the shepherd was watching a bit more closely, he noticed that the floor of the room was covered in razor blades. It was no wonder that the slippers of the princesses were worn and torn, since they were all dancing on the razor's edges. When one was torn to shreds, they just threw it away and put on a new one. When the 12 pairs of shoes were all danced to shreds, they sat down at the table. They all had a golden spoon and a fork to eat with. When one of them dropped her golden spoon, the shepherd boy quickly picked it up and put it into his bag. The other princess dropped her golden fork and the shepherd boy picked it up and put it into his bag as well. When the girls were finally satisfied, they all hurried back home. But this time the shepherd boy flew faster because he wanted to get home first. 
By the time the princesses reached the royal palace, the shepherd boy was finally laying in front of their beds, pretending to be fast asleep. He never even moved, the girls said. Look, he's fast asleep. Morning came and the shepherd went to see the king. The king asked him, Well, son, have you seen anything? Have you found out anything? I have, your majesty. I have seen things and I have found out things. At that point in time, the king summoned his three daughters and the shepherd started to speak. First, they went to a silver forest and here is the evidence. He produced the silver goblets and the silver twig. Then they flew on to the golden forest where they drank from their golden goblets. With that, he pulled the golden goblets and the golden twig from his bag. From there, they flew on to the diamond forest where they drank another cup. Finally, they stopped in a palace where they danced with devils and that's how they wore and tore all their slippers. In the meantime, they ate and drank too. One of them dropped her spoon, the other her fork. And here is the evidence, your majesty. Well done, son. The king ordered that the two elder daughters be locked up in the tower each night, gave his blessings to the youngest one, who married the shepherd boy. And that is how the slipper tearing came to an end. Hungarian Folk Tales Angel Lambs Once there lived a very poor man on the edge of the forest in his little hut with his wife and three sons. He earned his bread by cutting wood. Poor they were and their life was hard. One day the man was working in the forest and had become very tired. He took out his satchel to eat the scone his wife had baked him in the ashes of the fire. While he was chewing away on his food, there came an old man. What are you doing here, poor man? Just cutting some wood. What's that you're eating? Nothing special, just a scone baked in the ashes. Won't you have a little for yourself? Listen, my man, have you a family? Three sons, but they're still small. I need someone to serve me. I have a flock of sheep and it needs to be watched over. Give me your eldest son into service. Three days he will work and a hundred florins he will earn. Now the poor man went home very pleased and said to his son, listen, my boy, tomorrow you'll come with me to the forest and there you'll meet an old man who will take you into service. In the morning, his mother packed his satchel and off he went with his father to the forest. Hardly had they arrived when the old man came. He took the boy by the hand and led him away with him. Now they went deep into the forest until night fell. Then they came to a hut. Now, son, here we are. Daylight came, the boy went out, and there he saw the fine flock of sheep. This is the flock you are to watch over. Here's a staff for you to follow my lambkins. Here's a satchel for you so that you can bring back in it to me some of what they eat. And in it there's a flask for you to fill with whatever they drink from. So the lambs set off and made their way into the forest. The further they went in, the darker it became. Then they found a wide river before them and there was only a narrow plank to cross the river. The sheep set off, but their weight was such as to bend the plank until their bellies were in the water itself. Now this worried the lad. I'll never be able to cross on that plank, it'll collapse under me. The last of the lambs came to rub against his leg. Just climb onto my back and I'll take you across. But the boy struck its back roughly with the staff, lay on his stomach 
in the grass and waited. Some time later, he heard the sound of their bells as they came back. The last of them came to him and rubbed against his leg. Follow us. Then his master's request came to his mind. He gathered together a handful of grass for the satchel, put some water into the flask and followed the flock home. When they arrived, the old man was waiting for them in his yard. So, my boy, I see you've brought my lambkins home. Are they still all here? Yes, master. Did you bring what they ate? Yes, master. Did you bring what they drank? That too, master. Let me have a look. No, my boy, that's not what they ate, that's not what they drank, for these lambs of mine cannot live on this. You didn't do your proper service. Tomorrow, I'll take your next brother. But his younger brother didn't fare any better, for he did exactly the same with the old man's flock. At home, the poor man spoke to the youngest of his sons. Son, it's your turn. Tomorrow, you'll come with me to the forest. The next day, the old man was waiting for them. He took the boy by the hand and led him into the forest until it got dark. Here, my boy, is where you will sleep. In the morning, the old man came to knock on the door. The boy hung the satchel around his neck and sat off after the sheep. The sheep walked and walked along the edge of the forest. Once they went into the forest, everything got dark. In the middle of the forest, it was so dark that the youngest boy was gripped by fear. All the more when they came to the river. Oh, what will become of me if I cross the river as well? One of the lambs came to rub against the boy's leg. Child, sit on my back. So the boy sat on its back, and that's how they crossed the river. Once they were across, they went further and further into the dark until suddenly there was a great brightness in front of them. The boy had to rub his eyes, for there in the middle of the brightness was a chapel. The sheep quickly filed in. Once he was in, he saw the sheep shake themselves twice in front of the altar and change into angels. From a beautiful chalice, they served themselves each bread and a little wine. Then they shook themselves once again and turned back into sheep. The last of them to turn into an angel had taken the boy's satchel, then took bread, poured some wine into his flask and put both into his satchel before setting off with the others towards home. When they reached the river, the boy got onto the sheep's back again, crossed over the plank and set off home tranquilly. The old man was waiting for them in the yard. Now, child, are all the sheep here? All here, master. Have they eaten? They have, master. Have they drunk? They have, master. Well then, show me your satchel and your flask. My child, I can see that you have served me faithfully, and so I grant you a wish as well as the hundred florins you have earned. And that was when the boy knew that the old man was the Lord himself, and the lambs, his angels. So what he said was this, Master, I would like to serve you always. My only wish is to be allowed to go home once to my parents to bid them farewell. And that is what happened. Home he went, bade goodbye to his father, his mother and his two brothers, handed over to them his wages and returned to the old man, whom he still serves to this very day. Hungarian Folk Tales Susa In the village, there lived a wealthy farmer. He had barns and cellars and attics that were full of goods Plus, he also had a couple of hundred florins sewn into a sack. However, he also had a lazy, good-for-nothing, stupid wife who was truly 
useless. Each time the farmer was about to leave for work, he told Susa what to do. Go to the neighbour lady, see what she is doing, and do exactly as she does. So Susa walked over to the neighbour's house, where they were busy bleaching the linen. When she saw this, she went home, took her husband's boots and leather hat into the bleach and let them cook there. They must have been in there for a long time, because when she took them out, and she was about to take them to the stream for rinsing, they melted away in her hands. When her husband came home, he asked her, Well, Susa, what have you been doing all day? She told him what she had done, and the poor man had to give her a beating. Finally, he told her to pay more attention to the neighbour woman the next time. The next day, the neighbour woman was preparing mash for the pigs in a bucket. Susa saw what she was doing. She ran home, took ten sacks of barley flour and threw them all into the well. Susa was very proud of herself. She wanted to tell her husband how much mash she prepared for the animals. As soon as her husband came home, she immediately told him the story. Do you know what I did today? Mash! The whole well is full of the stuff. There'll be plenty for the pigs. What? Are you out of your mind, woman? That's exactly what I did. So Susan was beaten once more and her husband told her that if she did this again, he would teach her a lesson she would never forget. On the third day, the neighbour woman was cooking cabbage with bacon. Susa watched her, then went home, sliced up a whole block of bacon, then she took the bits and pieces to the garden and placed them on the cabbage heads. At noon, her husband came home and saw his dog lying dead by the gate. He asked his wife, What have you done to this dog, woman? Why did it drop dead? The thief ate all the bacon I was preparing for lunch in the garden. That killed him. The man looked into the pantry. The bacon was all gone. He realised what Susa must have done and he beat her soundly. The man kept all his money in a leather bag under the bed, but he never told his wife, lest she should spend it all. He told his wife that it was an ogre. He scared her by saying that if she did something stupid, the ogre would eat her. One day a travelling potter came their way. Susa wanted to give him the ogre so she wouldn't have to be afraid any longer. But of course, she did not want to give it away for free. So she asked the potter how many pots he would offer in return. Somehow the potter guessed what must be inside the ogre, so he gave her all of his pots. Susa was very happy with the deal. When she was left on her own, she placed the pots on the poles of the fence. Finally, she wanted to arrange the smaller mugs as well, but there was not enough room. Then she found a long pole and started yelling. All right, you pots, stand in line so there is room for the little ones too. But the pots just didn't want to stand in line, so Susa smashed the pots with her pole. When her husband came home, he immediately saw the fragments on the ground. He suspected that something was wrong, so he asked, Where did you get these pots, Susa? Well, you see, I paid for them with that ogre of yours, so you could never scare me with it again. The man nearly had a fit, but he realised that his wife was mad. The next morning, he sent Susa off to do some reaping, so she couldn't cause any more trouble at home. Susa went out to the field with a sickle, and by 10 o'clock, she harvested three sheaves of wheat. She pulled them together and arranged them in a stack. She huddled up in the middle and fell fast asleep. Her husband waited for her at home in vain. This Susa has suddenly become so hard-working. I'm going to go after her before the work makes her sick. He went out to the field, but however hard he looked, he just couldn't see Susa anywhere. Where could she be? He was about to go home when he finally noticed the three sheaves of wheat. He walked up closer and discovered Susa snoring beneath them. It's then that he realised he had to get rid of Susa once and for all. He ran home and brought back a pillow full of feathers and a small pot of honey. He poured the honey all over Susa and then he covered her with the feathers. Susa woke up. She looked at her hands 
and feet, and said to herself, Ah, er... Uh, her hands are like Susa's, her feet are like Susa's, but this is not Susa. How could this be? She just couldn't decide whether she was really Susa or not. Finally, she decided she would ask her husband whether his wife was at home. If he said yes, she is home, then she could not be Susa. If he answered no, then she must be Susa, without a doubt. When she got to the house, she called out loud, Listen, John, is your wife at home? Of course she is. What's wrong with that? That was how Susa finally decided that she was not Susa. She started thinking about who she might be, but she just couldn't find out the solution. So in the end, she completely lost her mind. Finally, she ran off and nobody has ever seen her since. Hungarian Folk Tales The Golden Lamb Once upon a time, there lived a poor man and his son. When the boy grew up, his father sent him away to work and earn some money. Off he went and searched for a place where he could work until he finally found a farmer who hired him as a shepherd for his sheep. The next day, his new master handed him a flute and sent him out with a flock to see if he knew what to do. Unlike the other lazy shepherds, the young lad never rested for a minute and herded the sheep and played the flute all day long. Among the sheep was a lamb with a golden fleece. Whenever the young lad played his flute, it began to dance. The boy grew to like the lamb so much, he decided to ask for the golden lamb instead of wages. As night fell, he took the flock home. The farmer stood waiting for him at the gate, and when he saw that none of his precious sheep had gone astray and all had eaten well, he was a happy man indeed. The boy and his master began to debate his wages. The lad said he would like the golden lamb. The master liked the little animal very much, but eventually agreed to let the boy have it because he was willing to work very hard. A whole year passed by. The boy worked well for his master and was given the lamb as his prize. He set off home, but it began to get dark just as he walked into a village. The shepherd boy eventually sought shelter with a farmer who had a daughter who fell so in love with the golden lamb that she decided to steal the animal for herself. It was nearly midnight by the time the girl got her hands on the lamb, but as soon as she touched it, her hands stuck to its golden fleece. The boy woke the next morning and saw the young girl with her hands stuck to the lamb. He did not want to leave the lamb behind, so off he set with the lamb and the girl with her hands stuck to its golden fleece. The three of them danced until they reached the third neighbour's house, where a woman poked her head out and saw the young girl dancing and prancing with the lamb. She rushed outside with her oven shovel and shouted, Get back home with you and stop making such a scene. The woman smacked her with the shovel. I said to do as you were told. But the girl carried on dancing, so the woman hit her with her shovel. But it stuck to her behind, with the woman on the other end. The lamb pulled them both through the village, all the way to the church. The lamb started to dance with the girl stuck to its fleece, who had the shovel stuck to her behind, and the woman on the end. The priest was just returning from the church and scolded them bitterly for making such a scene, but to no avail. The priest took his stick and struck the woman's behind with it and was surprised to see that his stick stuck to the woman's fat bottom and he was glued to the other end. The boy continued to trail them through the village where a soldier passed with his horse. He touched the priest and got stuck too. 
Then a weaver came out with a roll of linen. He smacked the horse's flank and the linen stuck to it in an instant. Then a cobbler appeared with his hands full of boots. He hit the weaver and cried, what are you staring at? And he too now was stuck to the procession. The boy blew on his flute and the lamb went on dancing with the girl stuck to its behind, the shovel stuck to her bottom, the woman to the handle of the shovel, the stick to her bottom, with the priest stuck to the other end, followed by the soldier leading the horse, with the linen stuck to its flank, the weaver stuck to the linen, with the boots on his back, and the cobbler at the very end. And the boy just went on marching with his peculiar parade until he reached a town where everyone was in mourning. The houses and palaces were all covered in black and the men and women were walking about in black clothes. At the edge of the town, the boy began talking to an old woman and asked her what had happened. The old woman sadly told him that the daughter of the king was seriously ill and no medicine was strong enough to cure her. The doctors all said that if someone could make her laugh, she would soon be cured, but no one had managed to do it yet. The king declared that anyone who could make his darling daughter laugh could marry her and receive half of his kingdom as a gift of thanks. Of course, there were many people who all wanted to try their luck. Princes, counts and acrobats from all kinds of nations and nationalities, but no one succeeded. No matter how hard they tried, the princess never even smiled and they all ended up with their heads impaled on a pole. The next morning, the boy announced that he intended to make the princess laugh. The king was happy to hear the news and asked his daughter to stand outside. The young shepherd began to play his flute. The golden lamb went on dancing with the girl stuck to its fleece, with the shovel on her behind, and the woman stuck to the shovel, the stick on her fat bottom, with the priest stuck to the other end, followed by the soldier with his horse, with the linen stuck to its flank, the weaver stuck to the linen, with boots on his back, and the cobbler at the end of the line. When the princess saw this, she burst out laughing and that made the golden lamb so happy that it shook everything and everyone off and began to dance alone. And then the girl began to dance, and then the woman, and then the priest, and then the soldier with his horse, and then the weaver, and even the cobbler. The king happily gave his blessing for the shepherd boy to marry his daughter. He gave the weaver and the cobbler royal warrants. He made the soldier his general and the priest his royal cardinal. The woman was promoted to royal baker and the girl became the princess's maid. The wedding feast went on for a week and a day and the whole kingdom celebrated the bride and groom. If the violin strings hadn't snapped, they would all still be dancing. Hungarian Folk Tales The Magic Lock Once upon a time, long ago and far away, there lived a poor woman and she had one son. One day she had to do the washing for someone and when she got home, she found the place empty. Where could her son have gone? Where could he be? No one could tell her. If only she had known that devils had taken him away. They had carried him off to hell to set him to work for them. When the boy had spent seven years with them, they assigned him seven rooms. He had to do everything, sweep them, clean them, dust them up, anything and everything he had to do. Now in the seventh room, there was a lock, a magic lock, and in that lock lived 12 devils. He worked and worked on that lock until he eventually stole it. 
he escaped from those devils and went straight off home to his mother. Now what did he say to his mother? He said, Mother, go to the king and ask him for his daughter's hand, for I would like to take her as my wife. Off went his mother to the king and asked for his daughter as a bride for her son. The king roared with laughter at the idea of such a lad wanting his daughter in marriage. So he said, Listen, my dear, I'll give my daughter to your son if during the night he can root up and destroy the forest that surrounds the village. Make it disappear without a trace. That's the only way my daughter will ever be his bride. So the poor woman went home and told her son what the king had said. Well, all the son had to say was, If that's all that's needed, that's how it will be. When evening fell, he turned the key in the lock, and right away there were twelve devils in front of him. Off you go, level that forest by morning, so roots and all have gone and nothing remains, not even a fallen acorn. And the devils set to work. Next morning there wasn't a sign or trace of the forest, even the roots had all been pulled up. The lad went to the king to report the task was done, and he had come to claim his daughter. You can have her if by morning there stands in the forest place a fine field of green corn. Now that was no bother to the lad at all. He had his magic lock which helped him to do it all, and by the morning in place of the forest there was a fine field of bright green corn. Again the lad went to the king and said, Your Majesty, I have done what you asked. The king looked out and saw the fine corn, but all he said was, Well indeed, you've done all your tasks, I'll give you one more. By morning lay out a road in front of my palace that is paved with diamonds, with trees at its sides and the trees full of birds. If you succeed in this task, then my daughter shall be yours. The lad went home and in the evening turned the key in the lock and in the morning in front of the king's palace sparkled a diamond road with flowering trees and the trees full of birds. The king looked out and was almost blinded by the glittering brightness and the beauty of the trees. He couldn't believe his eyes. For that it was worth giving his daughter's hand. And so it passed. On the following morning, there above the meadow hung a palace from a golden chain, and beautiful it was too. And that is where they lived. One day he went hunting, but he didn't take the lock with him and left it with his wife. She didn't know the value of the rusty old lock because her husband hadn't told her. Now the devils had a companion, and she was an ugly old witch. She happened to come by the palace, crying, New locks for old! New locks for old! The king's daughter heard her and was delighted, so she called out that she had one. Now that's just what the old witch wanted. Out she took from her pocket a new lock and exchanged it for the magic lock. Now the palace hanging from the golden chain immediately turned into a tumbled-down old shack. The princess cried and cried, but she couldn't imagine how it had happened. When her husband came back, he almost fell over when he saw the tumble-down shack standing where his fine palace should be. His wife wept and told him how she had exchanged the lock for a new one from the old woman. Her husband was consumed by sorrow when he heard this. But he pulled himself together, went to the king and told him the full and short of it. Off you go to Mother Moon, who is all of a hundred years old, and perhaps she will put things right. Off the lad went to see Mother Moon, who was all of a hundred years old. But Mother Moon couldn't do anything about it. She just gave him a dog and sent him to Mother Sun, who was all of two hundred years old. Off he went to her, but she just gave him a mouse and sent him on to Mother Wind, who was all of three hundred years old. He told her why he had come and she gave him a cat and told him that there on an island in the middle of the deep blue sea lived an old witch and it was she who had the lock. Wasn't he the happiest man there was? He did what he was told and went off to where Mother Wind told him to go. His way to the island wasn't easy, what with the mouse and the cat and the dog, but once they were there it took the three animals no time at all to bring him the lock. 
When they got home, the young husband of the king's daughter turned the key in the lock and straight away the palace was hanging there in its old place from a golden chain. The young pair were so happy and they lived happily ever after. Hungarian folk tales. Cerceruska. Once upon a time, there lived a widower who had two daughters. His next door neighbor was a widow who never stopped recommending herself to the man. Hey, neighbor, take me for your wife. You won't regret it. I will bring up your two daughters and I'll be like a real mother to them. One day, the poor man finally gave in and married the widow next door. But it did not take long for the woman to start treating the girls badly. She tried everything to get them away from the house. She nagged her husband, take them both to the forest and just leave them there. Let them perish. That was something horrible for the father's ears, but still, he did as the woman wanted him to. Tercerushka, that was the name of the elder girl, heard what her father and stepmother were about to do. So she filled her pockets with grain, so she would leave a trail behind. Early next morning, the father took out his two daughters. Tercerushka just kept spilling the grain from her pockets all along the way. When they were deep in the middle of the forest, their father told them, well, my girls, I think it's about time to take a rest because we are all very tired. And the girls went to sleep. When the girls woke up, they started calling their father, but he was already far, far away. Don't you worry, little sister. We will trace our way back along the grain that I spilled as we came this way. But they couldn't find the grain because the birds had pecked it all up and the girls just couldn't find their way home. On top of all of that, their stepmother had cursed them before they left. If you drink from the track of an animal, you are going to change into that animal. As they were walking in the endless forest, the younger girl became thirsty. She spotted the footprint of a cow that was full of clean water. Sister, oh dear sister, I'm so thirsty, I have to drink. Don't drink, sister, because you will turn into an animal. A little later, the little girl got left behind and she drank from the footprint of a deer. When Tertserushka looked back, she saw the little deer running after her. Tertserushka kept on going forward with the deer, following her until she finally found a hollow tree. There she gathered up some dry leaves and made a comfortable bed. One day, a young prince was hunting in the forest and he spotted the beautiful Tertserushka. The prince called after them. Come on out, you beautiful girl. I cannot, because I have a dear sister and you want to kill her. Come on out with the deer. I won't touch her. So Tertserushka finally came out and she was so beautiful that the prince was lost for words. When he found his voice again, he immediately asked her to marry him. Let's get married. I'll be yours and you'll be mine and we'll live happily forever and a day. He kissed her and embraced her. Then they both got on his horse and the prince married the girl. Time passed by. The king was on a hunt one day when Tertserushka gave birth to a son. His name was Little King Andriku. Before I forget what I was going to say, I wanted to tell you that there lived a mean cook in the court who had an ugly daughter. She had always dreamt that her own daughter would be the queen one day, so it was no surprise that she hated Tsertserushka. Your Majesty, you are so beautiful. There is a pond in the garden. You should go and take a look at yourself. 
they walked around the water, the cook suddenly shoved her into the pond. When this was done, the cook woman quickly changed her own daughter's dress and made her lay down in Ter Terushka's bed. Soon the king returned from the hunt. The evil cook told him the good news. You have a son. His name is little King Andriku. Just take a look, your majesty. The king was very happy and he kissed the baby boy. He was about to kiss his wife, but he was horrified at what he saw. Oh my goodness, what became of my wife? How could she become as ugly as this? It was childbirth that did it to her, explained the cook. The king was sad, but since there was nothing he could do, he finally accepted the change. Each night, Tserushka came back and visited the deer in her room. She kept asking, Is little King Andriko crying? Of course he is, dear sister. Barren women have no milk. One day the cook's daughter heard this. She was determined to get rid of the deer before it caused her downfall. So she said to the king, Darling husband, I'm feeling very weak. I will feel no better until I can eat the heart and liver of this little deer. The deer must be killed. As they were sharpening the knife and washing the bowl for her blood, the deer ran out to the pond and called out, My darling Terterushka, get up from the depths, from the stomach of the big fish because they want to cut my throat with a knife. They want to catch my blood in a bowl. They want to kill me too. Then Tserushka stepped out of the pond, walked up to the deer and stroked her gently. She was even more beautiful than before. The king heard and saw everything because he was secretly following the deer. He embraced and kissed Tserushka, who told him everything. The king immediately went to see the cook said to the cook, What would you do to the person who would not hesitate to destroy my wife? What? I would have the person tied to a horse's tail and have him dragged through the town. And the old woman and her daughter were treated exactly as the old hag had predicted. The king took Tserushka and the little deer back to the palace and they all lived happily ever after.